right at your anchor line. Gravy. Come on, come on, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. I don't like doing this. Across that anchor line, it sure is. He's right down on it. Come on, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and welcome to Question and Answers Part 2. I've done one of these before in the past. It's been a while, but I figured I'd do some more. Uh, answer some questions that have been asked to me via Facebook or YouTube or even personally emailed to me. And uh, share it with you guys so hopefully everyone can up their fishing game by picking on something, picking up something a little bit different uh, than via me just writing it back to that individual. So let's get started. Now here's a question written into me that says, what is the different fishing seasons? Well, this guy's from Northern California. What are the primary fishing seasons and what is this pre-spawn, spawn and post-spawn patterns of bass and, and salmon? Well, pre, during and post-spawn, pre is just before they spawn, spawning's in the middle of their spawn and post is after, in case you don't know the terminology, so that's all it means. Well, bass generally spawn from 58 to 60 degrees. It's right around a full moon, right around those times. And if it's raining and windy, a lot of the time they're gonna wait for the next clear sunny day to start spawning. So basically pre-spawn is right around 55 to 57 degrees, right in that range. You're gonna start looking for pre-spawn fish. That's when those bass are gonna move up to those deeper ledges near those big flats with those hard bottoms and stable areas so they can spawn up there. Once they reach that, 58 to 60 degree water column and it's nice calm and sunny to where they're getting good sun down on the beds that's the spawn time and then post spawn is once they're done spawning their big females are going to move off the bells the males will still be up there protecting fry you'll see them with the minnows up there and the females will move back down to those ledges again now this usually just happens in the spring. I know that temperature range can happen in the fall again, but it doesn't happen that way. The pre, spawn, and post are all taking place in the spring, so keep that in mind. Now the question also stated, what are the seasons for salmon? Well, we're here in Northern California, and this individual is too, so this is going to vary in your area, but over here in Northern California, they start entering our bays uh, in the mouth of the Delta, I mean, the mouth of the Delta, our bays, and out generally in the month of September. Once that water temperature starts to cool off a little bit and they're gonna start moving into the rivers in that way and they're gonna move up through the Sacramento River. Um, basically, Rio Vista area out, you know, by the, uh, what is that, San Pablo Bay up there. They're gonna move through there first. Um, you can still troll for them. You can still roll baits out there a little further out because they're still in that feeding mood. Uh, once they start getting into the deltas, you wanna use reaction baits like big spinners, uh, you know, flatfish style bait, something that kicks all over because they're gonna stop eating and they're gonna get more aggressive because they're switching into that spawning phase to where they're gonna be pushing the other males back and getting real aggressive and taking their territory. So reaction baits are the deal at that time. Uh, once they start moving up the Sacramento River, uh, further up, jigging works real good for them and there's a couple other methods that I don't like to suggest to people because it's not very game-like. Uh, but generally, September all the way till mid-November, the end of November, uh, before they start turning into zombies and decaying on you. You can find them in the river systems earlier in the, you know, earlier in the fall, that September, October, you're going to find them still near the bay, uh, in the mouth of the delta. And then as uh, October, November rolls around, you're going to find them further up. So that's your salmon right there. Now also, he said stripers. Now stripers, here's a real common misconception. People think the stripers come into the, into the delta systems here in Northern California in the fall, leave, and come back in the spring. That's not the case. They come in uh, September, October, around the same time the salmon do. They come up in here and they're real active for a while while the water's still warm. And then they search out those deeper lakes on the delta or those deeper cold holes down there on the bottom and they settle in there for like that December, January, February. And as the water starts picking up into the mid 60s again, generally about April, May, they start spawning. And they go in there and they spawn and they take off back out to the bays at that point. A lot of your males and your juveniles are gonna stay in the delta. Um, now, this is where people get confused. They say, well, where does the striper spawn? Well, the stripers get out there, they spray, and the males come through and they spray. Now, how would that work if the water was running all one direction? Well, they wouldn't spawn very well because the 
spray would be over here and the eggs would be over here and they would never meet one another. Stripers spawn in back eddies. Anywhere you see that water swirling around, when rivers meet one another, you see those sections where that water swirls around? They spray in those areas. So anytime you find the rivers meeting one another and you see those back eddies, that's a good spot for stripers in that later spring to start looking for them from there. So let's move on to the next question. So the next question I got, this gentleman asked me, a lot of my friends like to use snap swivels on the front of their lures when fishing. And he's heard that this can negatively affect the way the lure works. And he's absolutely correct. If you had a little tiny snap swivel with a little round bend and you were using it on something like this, it's not going to affect this rip bait very much. But a lot of people don't understand the sizing chart and the snap swivels, nor am I gonna get into that. Rather, what I'm gonna tell you is take the time learn some good knots and do not use snap swivels. If this is hooked onto your bait right here, look how big and bulky this can be. What's happening is this bait's designed to have a certain action and displace a certain amount of water. What you're doing is negatively affecting the hydrodynamics of this bait by having resistance in front of it. Now when this head pulls, it has to pull back against something that is not lined, nor was it designed on a snap swivel at the same time. And a lot of snap swivels aren't round. They have that little V to them to where you're gonna end up pushing it off to one side and you're gonna add weight to the side of your bait so it's gonna run untrue. Learn to not use snap swivels and tie a lot of knots. I often take the little split rings that come on the front of your baits that you can tie onto, the little ring right there because there's an edge and it'll get caught on your line if you tie on there. So I remove those and what I'm gonna to suggest to you is learning the double surgeon's loop knot or another favorite loop knot if your buddy knows how to show you one. What's gonna happen with the loop knot, you're gonna not have any resistance against the front of your bait that has action to it. If your bait doesn't have action, it's like a jig or something like that to where you're putting the action into it, a little snap swivel is not going to hurt you very much, but learn to tie on your baits without snap swivels, even though you're going to be switching through a lot. I've been out many of days where I've had to switch through 50 and 60 different baits, and the only thing it's going to do is make you better at tying knots and be become much more efficient and not look like an amateur or negatively affect the way that your bait's going to run. So another question I got from multiple guys that watch my bait fishing videos, here on the West Coast we have sliders almost in every tackle shop. Well it's recently came to my attention that over in the Midwest and back east a lot of these tackle shops don't carry sliders. And they say, oh what do I need to do? Do I need to order it offline? You can if you want one or you can just make one. A real simple thing to do is take a big snap swivel just like so and right where you would normally tie onto that eye, run the line through it. You notice something now? Starting to slide around. Now a lot of guys are asking me, well I have my leader on the end. They put on another little barrel swivel and they run their leader, but they say, well the eye of the snap swivel is too big. It's gonna come over the end of my other barrel. So all you do from there is you take a bead, if I can grab it, and you run the bead right up behind it like so. So now you can hook your weight on there, and there you go. You have your slider, just like so. And this works also really good if it's real muddy and it's getting caught in a conventional slider, to switch over this. Your bite detection's a lot better like this. Um, but it has more moving parts um, versus a regular slider, and it is metal. Uh, your sliders a lot of the time are plastic to where if they do get caught in something, a lot of the time if your line's stronger, it'll break away and you'll still catch your fish. If you get caught like this, chances are you're probably going to bust your line off in this at the same time uh, due to the metal moving parts. Or use a smaller snap swivel, something that's a little bit weaker that will break away before your line. So keep that in mind, but this works really good as a slider. Stay with us guys, and when we come back, it'll be back to more fishing Q&A. Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and when it comes to spooling up my reels, I choose nothing less than the best, and that's why I use P-Line each and every time. Are you fishing the best? Hey, Ryan, baby. <laughs> Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today.
Ever tried pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today so go to www.rustylures.com have you had the chance to fish the baddest hoochie on the market today that's right i'm talking about the shasta tackle wiggle hoochie one of the most dynamic reaction trout and salmon lures that runs second to no other for pulling and triggering fish into striking so i guess the real question is are you catching all the fish you should be catching thanks for watching guys now let's get back to the questions so here's another question from a guy coming out of Berkeley. He says there's a lot of sharks over the pier that he fishes and a lot of bat rays, but he doesn't really know the gear to use them. He sees people catching them. I'll tell you a really simple trick here. You can either take a 6 aught regular J hook or a 8 aught circle hook, go buy a squid, cut that squid in half, stick it through the hook once, fold it over, stick it through the hook again, and get you a 3 ounce pyramid weight. Now the thing is with these sharks, they're going to bite your line in half a lot of the time if they get up to it. So what you want to do is you want to buy either some 40 pound mono to use for a leader and use 20 pound as your main line um, or you can learn to do wire leaders. Wire coated leader and 65 pound wire coated leader is pretty supple. All you need some little wire crimps and some little A5 sleeves are the size that you want to pick up. You're going to see them, little sleeves and wire leader. It's not overly complicated. Go into the tackle shop. I say I need 65 pound wire coated leader. They'll give you that and the A5 sleeves. You put those over, you fold it back through, you crimp it on, the shark's not gonna bite through that. Uh, basically, shark and rays are pretty darn hardy. They'll be pounding on it, you're not gonna miss the hook set. Basically, when they're bang, 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 slapping, wait for your rod to load down before you set the hook, and then hang on, make sure you have your drag set good. You could end up hooking a 100 plus pound potential ray. If your drag's not set good, you're gonna wreck your reel, break your rod, snap your line. It'll be exciting, but you're gonna lose your fish. So set your drag, 65 pound wire coated, A5 sleeves, um, A dot regular hook, I mean a A dot circle hook, I'm sorry, or a six dot regular J hook will do the trick for you. 20 pound main line. If you don't wanna use wire, use 40 pound mono as your leader. Go catch some. Now here's a question I just got on my Facebook. I posted up, said, hey, who wants to ask me a question? I'll put it up. Uh, Michael here. Can you tell me where I could go fishing around the California Delta in the Tracy Stockton area? What baits to use and where I could go to catch some fish pretty quick along with his family to take them out and have some fun? Well, there's the Clifton Court 4 Bay over in Tracy. It's got a lot of shoreline. There's usually stripers around there. Uh, within the next two months here, we're gonna have a lot of stripers over there. Um, late spring, it's a good time. Um, around late fall it's usually really good over there for stripers catfish you can catch throughout the year um, if you want to catch them both learn how to brain rig watch my video on bait dunking for delta stripers the link will be right here at the bottom of the screen uh, you guys can check that out and learn how to brain rig on there you'll catch stripers and catfish the same way with the identical rigging now if you move up to stockton you might as well come into downtown there's walkways everywhere easily accessible go right there behind the port stadium you can throw around the same times of year. You can catch big catfish. Uh, you can catch big carp. You want to use dough bait, stop at the local tackle shops, tell them you want some carp bait. If you catch one of those, you're going to feel like you hooked a tank. Um, there's a lot of stripers around there. Not too many huge stripers in the warmer months. Usually November, December, January, February, you're going to get bigger stripers back there, but it's hard to take the family out. Um, late fall, you can get some pretty good stripers back there up to about 25 inches. Uh, you know, 20 to 25 inches is a pretty good one for that area. And later in the spring is going to be the same thing. And do that uh, bait dunking on my video there, the brain rig, and you'll light them up. You can also use thread fin shad uh, the same way I do it in the video is fine. Or you can use the whole shad and just wrap it up with some sticky thread the same way I show you in that video. So check that one out, guys. Uh, those two areas, I guarantee you catch a lot of fish. And it's a good place to take the family and easily accessible. So here's a question I got from a guy. He says he does a lot of bass fishing, but he doesn't have a boat and he can't afford a boat. And a lot of his buddies are into competitive bass fishing. He says, well, they're always out on boats and he only gets the option to bank fish, but he wants to step up his bass fishing game before he decides to get a boat or he doesn't want to be embarrassed when he goes out with these guys with boats. Now, he wants to know how can he do a lot better 
fishing from the bank. Well, here's the thing. Bank fishing spots that are easily accessible are fished by numerous anglers. But the thing is, the majority of bank fishermen are more amateurs. I'm not saying there's not some good ones. I get out there and practice with these guys the same way. Uh, but the majority of them are amateurs. And what amateurs have the tendency of doing is casting out and moving a bait way too fast. So when you're out bank fishing and you want to get fish and you want to focus, the things you should focus on is your finesse fishing, like uh, wacky rigging, drop shotting, Texas rigging, worms, and plastic baits. Um, from there, you're gonna move into your hard baits. Your hard baits, you're gonna be able to pick up a lot easier uh, than your soft baits and your finesse baits. So my wacky rigging videos right down here on the bottom, learn this one, practice it thoroughly, focus to everything I say, and I guarantee you'll catch a lot of fish out there. Then here's the, uh, my drop shot fishing video right here on the bottom, this one. And then here's my plastic rigging video right here on this link. If you practice all three of these, get out there, pull some stick baits like some Senkos, um, some Zoom trick worms, and wacky rig like some Reaction Innovation flirts, and be really thorough. Take your time. And when you start telling yourself they're not biting, get over that. Focus on what your bait is doing the whole entire time. And another thing, these guys from the bank, they get out there and they bomb it straight out. That's a huge mistake. Most fish and 99% of bass are cover and structure oriented fish. That means they're right next to what you're fishing at. If you're casting straight out, you're wasting kind of your time. What you want to do is you want to get out, look at the water, look at the bank, and from that bank, picture a 45 to 65 degree angle out. Cast out there and progressively work your bait back in slowly. Where you get bit, when you set that hook, you're going to see where that bass is. Now try to throw down that line and work through there to see if you can pick up more. Because closer you are to the bank, the more cover and structure you're going to find versus throwing way out there. Yeah, chances are they haven't seen a bait way out there, but also the chances are there's not anything to hold that fish out there. So fishing tighter to the cover and structure is good. Get you a good pair of like Tevas or Keens and step out into the water knee deep. If it's not blistering cold, get out there, step out and then parallel the bank and walk down. Get a little bit muddy, don't wear any nice tennis shoes. Get out there and walk down and make the cast other anglers will not make. If there's not, new, if there's not too many snags around, use fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon is like crystal clear under the water. This is 100% P-line fluorocarbon. They don't see this stuff. That's gonna give you a huge edge over the amateurs too that are throwing mono because it's the most affordable line they can find. You're gonna detect bites better and the fish are not gonna see fluorocarbon under that water if there's no visual snags around, not a lot of trees. But if there is a lot of trees around, what you wanna focus on at that point is switching over to braid. Okay, a lot of guys are gonna make that easy cast, you know, three foot out in front of that tree but if you use like some 50 pound braid, which is only 12 pound diameter, this stuff's tough as nails. Take that risky shot, you hook the fish, yank them out of there. You know, you don't have that boat to pull them up in on there. And with those guys using lighter generic or lines, they're gonna break off. And potentially that fish has never seen a bait. A hundred anglers can go by, but they're not risking and taking that shot in there. So pick up some 50 pound braid. If you get snagged up in the tree, try not to pull against your rod pull against your line a lot of times you're going to break that tree branch off or you're going to bend that hook out and then fix your hook or replace your hook but don't lose your whole 12 or 15 dollar lure you're going to save baits that way you're going to catch a lot more fish that way so hopefully those tips helped you out now here's a really good question that i got a real simple one-liner what are the main considerations when trying to locate fish that is the best single question anyone can ask you because i don't care who you are if you go out to a pond and it has no fish, even if you're Kevin Van Dam, you're not gonna catch a bass. I can personally guarantee you that. Locating fish, that's everything. That's the whole word right there. Elements are gonna tell you where the fish are. The sun, the weather, the water temperature is gonna dictate the movement. So what are some real simple elements that you can use to your advantage to catch fish? Well, first off, look at the moon. You ever hear anybody talking about fishing moon phases? New moon means black moon, practically no light. Full moons, completely full. The full moon, give fish light at nighttime. The new moon, black at night. So after a new moon, first thing in the morning, guess what, you're gonna have active fish, but you still don't know where they're at, okay? And the opposite stands true with the full moon, you're gonna have active fish at nighttime. Not in the morning, because they've been eating all night and they're waiting for that light to come back up again. Make it easy for them to come up to the surface, eat some stuff. Another really cool element is the wind. 
The wind is a fantastic dictator. If you have wind that's consistently over five to eight miles an hour blowing in one general direction of the lake, let's say it's blowing to the south corner of that lake, guess where the majority of the food's gonna be blown to? Not the north. It's gonna be blowing all that small plankton, micro shrimp, all those microorganisms gonna be blowing down to the south end. Smaller fish are gonna to come to eat those, medium fish are gonna eat those, and giant fish are gonna eat those. So that wind's a good tell all for those. Now, what else is there? Well, let's say you look down a bank and you see a thousand feet of straight bank. Well, you don't see a tree on there, you don't see a stump on there, but at the end of that thousand feet, you see a long point. A long point comes out there. Well, there's structure for you. Points in lakes, you know, 75% of the time, even more, always hold fish. Even if the wind's not blowing on it, wind, wind blowing points, even better. But points always hold fish. Points, uh, look for windy blowing areas. Look at the moon. If it's real bright out, the majority of the fish like to go deeper. If it's low light, the fish come out shallow. This is why your buddy says, oh, we're gonna go out first thing in the morning because that's when we always catch fish. No, because they're not letting their baits get down deep enough. That doesn't mean you can't catch them in the middle of the day. It just means they were, they happen to be where your buddy was casting or we're gonna go out at nighttime because it's a lot easier. No, because they happen to be fishing shallower and therefore the fish were there at that point again. So keep those little elements in mind and focus on those. There's a whole lot more to break down later on for you guys and I'll do more detailed videos on those, but that's a few things to help you get out there and track, track down some active fish a little bit faster. That's question and answers with Nick the Informative Fisherman. Make sure to check out the original part one down here on the bottom, click that, it'll take you there. And uh, here's a couple more episodes for you guys to check out. Uh, we've got a lot of, lot of awesome episodes out there for you guys. You can click any one of these and uh, it'll take you there and you can check it out and give me some feedback. Hope you enjoy the show and uh, I'll talk to you shortly. Take care, guys.